Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am Dr. Marta Lebazzi, the Executive Manager of the World Federation of Public Health Association. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar on building confidence on COVID-19 vaccination. I'm pleased to co-chair this event with Professor Michael Moore, that is a past president of WFPHA, but also the chair of its International Immunization Policy Task Force that is behind this event, as well as a series of policies now focusing on increased inequitable access uh, to COVID-19 uh, vaccination. Today, we will discuss with an amazing group of speakers how to boost confidence in vaccination in general and more specifically in COVID-19 vaccination. We know that there are uh, myth and disinformation and fake news all around us that are impacting and a lot about uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, immunization activities. And we will discuss leverages and uh, tools that, that can help us as public health professional to tackle this problem. Our first speaker will be Professor Julie Lisk from um, Australia. Professor Lisk will discuss how to address COVID-19 uh, vaccination hesitancy from research to action. Professor Lisk is a social scientist and professor in the Susan Wackel School of Nursing and Midwifery in Sydney. She was named overall winner of the Australia Financial Review 100 Women of Influence in 2019. Uh, Julie has uh, a qualification in nursing and midwifery, a master of public health and a PhD in public health. And her research focuses on risk communication uh, with a special focus on vaccine hesitancy and refusal. Professor Lisk will be followed by uh, Professor uh, Maciel from uh, Brazil. She is a professor at the Federal University of Espirito Santo, and she is the current president of the Brazilian Tuberculosis Network. She is a nurse with a PhD in epidemiology, and she has worked uh, almost whole her career focusing on the epidemiology of tuberculosis as well as the social determinants of it. And she is uh, working now on the approach to public health system for emergency preparedness and response to epidemics in infectious disease. Professor Marcel will highlight how the political and religious determinants of health are impacting the um, approach to uh, COVID-19 vaccination in her country. And last but not least, Professor Anna Odone from Italy uh, will discuss uh, the health work attitude in regard to COVID-19 vaccination. Professor Odone is a full professor and director of the School of Public Health at the University of Pavia in Italy. She's a medical doctor by training with a specialization in hygiene and public health. She has an MSc in epidemiology and MPH in health policy and management and a PhD in medical science. Her main activities are focusing on the control of infection disease with a focus on vaccine and immunization program and policies. Uh, this event is uh, supported by the University of Geneva and by Pfizer. And uh, uh, before opening uh, um, the, the, the webinar, inviting the first speaker, I would like to invite each of you to start posting your question in our chat box, because we really want to have a live discussion with each of you. And this will be started right after the uh, three uh, speeches. Thanks a lot, and Professor Lisk, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lamazzi, and it's wonderful to be here. A very warm welcome to all our participants, wherever you are in the world. And uh, I'm going to just share my screen now. And I'm going to be talking to you about very broadly about vaccine hesitancy and uh, and just giving some global trends on what it's looking like in terms of COVID-19 vaccine, 
uh, some communication tips we've learned from vaccine communication science over many years, and also some thoughts about responding to misinformation, which is, of course, the challenge of our time. But I want to start with the context because context is always key to how we manage any communication issue or hesitancy more generally. And we are in a formative time. It is a volatile environment. We have people who've, whose lives have been severely disrupted with people who are grieving, people who are still fearful. And now we have this global vaccine program beginning to roll out. And people tend to be normally cautious with new vaccines. Um, and of course, that's been, I think, accentuated with this pandemic. Usually uh, beliefs and, and attitudes towards vaccination of children, for example, are reasonably stable. It takes a while to start affecting them in populations. But in COVID-19 vaccination, those beliefs are shaping right now. So what happens in the communication environment has a very strong agenda setting role. And of course, as we all know, the activists against vaccination are energised and we will see their messages come out no matter how much we try to censor them. So uh, they've, we've also seen them join with lockdown protesters and others who object to the uh, constraints the pandemic has brought on liberties. But I want to start with a broader picture of vaccine uptake. Because whilst we do tend to focus on hesitancy, vaccine uptake is not just about hesitancy. And in fact, we, with our um, increasing vaccination model we're using with WHO, would locate hesitancy here. It's a motivational construct. It's an intentional phenomenon. It's not a behaviour. Um, the behaviour is vaccination, the action of vaccinating oneself or one's child. Um, but that hesitancy or motivation is influenced by what people think and feel, their snap judgments, their confidence in vaccine safety and its benefits, social processes, what others in their environment are doing, people that they trust, people that they look up to, social media influences, and practical issues. And we must never forget that uptake is not just about what goes on in the heads of people. It's also about what goes on in their environment and how services make it easy for them to access vaccination, how they're reminded by systems and how we can ensure that there's equity of access to vaccines, not just with supply, but through very accessible services. Now, what's interesting about vaccination is that we tend to get the language a bit jumbled up sometimes, and we call people who aren't going to vaccinate anti-vaxxers sometimes. But what this recent research from Imperial College and YouGov has shown is that when you ask people whether they'll take the vaccine or not, among those who say they won't, there's a proportion who are opposed to vaccines in general, say with France, 9%. But right now in France, 48% say they won't take the vaccine. So not wanting a COVID-19 vaccine doesn't necessarily mean that you're against all vaccines. And that's an important distinction to make when we're thinking about how to manage the issue of hesitancy around COVID-19 vaccines. And we've conceptualised the different positions on COVID-19 vaccination in this way through thinking about the communication tasks that might be required. So there are people who are anti-vaccination activists. They're small, they're vocal, we all know them. There are people who are rejecting and intending to reject the COVID-19 vaccine. There are people who are hesitant, they're not sure. There are people who are accepting of it. There are people who really want it and they'll line up. And there are people who are advocates. And the communication tasks with all of those groups are similar, but they're also different. 
we may want to do anything from minimise the impact of anti-vaccination activists right through to supporting the advocacy and the keenness of those who are advocates with good information tools to share in their networks. With the Global Advisory Group on Vaccine Safety with WHO, we've developed a communication module uh, around vaccine safety communication. And we've drawn on the principles of risk communication, which say that you need to prepare for all sorts of events. And particularly with COVID-19 vaccination, like any new vaccine program, there will be incidents and events that come up, whether they be around safety or delivery of the vaccination. And preparing and setting up the lines of communication now before those events occur is crucial. We need to identify threats to confidence. We need to listen to audiences, use communication science in helping develop messages and then pre-test those messages with target audiences. For example, in Australia, if you were to say smoking is deadly to uh, an Indigenous person, an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, that would have a completely different meaning to how most people would take that because the term deadly in Australia uh, for First Nations people is a very positive thing. It means something is good. Oh, that's deadly. So pre-testing because the meanings for, for different audiences will be different. Working closely with the media, journalists in general um, want to see vaccine confidence sustained. So working with them and those good motivations, helping them access good sources, good information in a timely way is absolutely crucial and building a social media presence and ensuring a good clinic experience will also help shore up resilience against all the various threats to vaccine confidence. This is a quote for, from a study by Amy Crichton in Gomorrah country in New South Wales in Australia, which is someone talking about the importance of engagement in primary care. So the service may have spoke to one mum, but guess who that mum has spoken to in the next couple of hours? 20 mums, and she is passing that on. You might not have that flash brochure, but the power and the time that you've put into her, she is putting that into her friends. So whilst we might have challenges with social media, we also have strengths in other networks and in social media networks as well, where people can be sharing positive information and positive influences around encouraging vaccination or, or encouraging people to um, have their concerns addressed. So let's get to responding to misinformation. It's important to be strategic here because there's so much and because there are opportunity costs in responding, it will take people's time away from other important things. It's important to, to choose wisely when to respond. Um, is it being shared a lot? So that's not just about counting the volume of messages out there, for example, the volume of tweets. It's about counting the ex potential exposures to those messages because some people don't have many followers on social media, but they're sending out a lot of infamous information, whereas some people will have a lot of followers and one tweet will have a much greater reach. Is it affecting behaviour potentially? Using behavioural science, using research to determine that. Um, looking at coverage trends and um, preparing people. If it is doing either of those things, preparing people or what they call psychological inoculation, which is giving people small doses of that opposing view so that they're ready for when they see it in the wild, if you like. Um, and this communication handbook here has just been developed by Stefan Lewandowski and colleagues and is a very practical guide for addressing all sorts of issues, particularly COVID-19 vaccine misinformation. Another handy guide is developed by UNICEF and colleagues, which is a vaccine misinformation management guide, which has some useful tips like what it looks like to give people factual information that's intended to debunk misinformation um, from starting with the fact, warning people, 
about what they're about to hear, telling them what the fallacy is, and then ending with the fact. So you make the most of that recency and primacy effect, what you hear first and what you hear last. And for responding to misinformation, of course, using trusted spokespeople, don't feed the trolls because they're just going to suck energy out of you and they'll, you, they'll probably be given more attention and oxygen. Often we have discussions and debates about vaccine safety or effectiveness or necessity when underneath that are the real issues such as people's desire for protection. Sometimes they see themselves as needing protection from vaccines. Um, the worry about the purity of the body and maintaining that and, and that moral intuition of purity versus disgust that vaccines can ignite in people. The desire for self-determination and choice. Um, some people are processing grief and trauma through the issue of vaccination, particularly those who might believe a vaccine caused their health problems or a relative's problems. And belonging. Uh, if someone believes that they're part of a network that doesn't vaccinate, then they may not want to vaccinate because they want to belong. So all of these things are important to address in some form, even if it's simply acknowledging them mentally um, while staying calm when you encounter things that you know are wrong and get frustrated with. We've developed for individual clinical communication, these vaccine communication pathways in talking about immunization.org.au. And we recommend that there's this process of screening where people are at. Are they ready? Are they hesitant? Are they intending to decline? And, and using different communication tools depending on where they're at. But what's common here is the importance of recommending vaccination to people if you're a healthcare professional or any advocate. The timing and the tone might differ depending on where people are at but a recommendation is powerful. And it's particularly powerful if you can build rapport with someone to begin with. So take home messages. It is a formative time for these COVID-19 vaccines. It's not just hesitancy or motivational issues that affect uptake, it's also practical issues. Good communication and good process and experiences with healthcare, with vaccine delivery, will build program resilience. Use communication as a two-way process, not just broadcasting. Use communication science, including to address misinformation, understand those deeper issues. And in the words of Victor Montori, who's a guru in shared decision-making, be careful and kind. And in finishing, I wanna share with you a, a, a picture of, of um, Professor O'Donnell and I in Italy when uh, she hosted me as a visiting professor there at the University of Parma. Um, and of course, we're eating Italian food. And uh, some on the left, some resources there from WHO that are just out around um, um, using data to inform program planning, uh, communication guidance, dealing with misinformation, lots of resources there. So uh, have a look at those if you want more information. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Leesk. Uh, that was very interesting in setting the groundwork for this webinar and the around the issues of hesitancy and the broad issues that, uh, that drive those. And more importantly, to put in a positive context that uh, we're talking about building confidence. We really appreciate it. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Professor Ethel Maciel from Brazil. Thank you very much for the invitation. I try to share my screen right now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. And, <laughs> and now it's uh, ready in the right mode. Thank you. And uh, I think what I'm, I'm discuss right now is like an example of, of Professor Julie just, just show. Brazilian right now, unfortunately, is a, is a case for 
all this misinformation and denial of science that we are we are living at this time in Brazil. So we will discuss a little bit about this political and religious uh, determination of especially in the hesitation of vaccination in Brazil. So I will talk a little bit about the negationism, the, the denial movement that comes from the central power in Brazil. This is the biggest problem right now. And the coronavirus, the COVID-19, the denial movement came from all of the place, from the political, from the religious, and, and uh, it's, it's very strange, but came from medical authorities too. So we have an environment in Brazil right now, there is a very danger for vaccination and, and uh, uh, anti-vax movement. And I will try to, to finish with our reaction of the scientific, scientific activism of society, of the scientific society and independent research. So this denial movement, the negationism in the central power came from our president. So it's a very, very uh, power information that came from him. And I'm just point out the, um, the speech that he, he did all over this, this COVID-19 time, only about vaccination. He has a lot of misinformation in, from, from mask, from uh, social, uh, social distance, but I will focus on, on the vaccination. So he, he, he speak loud, that he didn't get the vaccine. He will not get the vaccine. He don't believe in the efficacy of the, the vaccine because this vaccine, the, the COVID-19 vaccine was very fast. They didn't have the efficacy. And so he did not believe that. Uh, and the most uh, amazing sentence that he, he, he said that it's like a, a strange, but it's real. He said that if you got the, the shot, you can become an alligator, alligator. So this, this can be like a nonsense sentence, nonsense phrase, but for, a, as Dr. Uh, Julie said, for a very special group of, of our indigenous people, this has an important message because they believe that we can, um, we can turn yourself in an animal. And right now we have the indigenous people with uh, hesitation for, for vaccine that you never have this before in Brazil. So this is what we are, we are living, we are doing, we are passing in Brazil. So this is the, the picture of the launch of the, the national vaccination campaign in Brazil in the end of December. And you can see uh, here is the president without mask, the minister of health without mask. And this is a very important, uh, um, it's, a, it's a mascot of the national vaccination campaign in Brazil since 1986, we call Zé uh, is his name the name of the mascot, and it's a very important, um, very important symbol for our children, for our vaccination campaign. He is in all vaccination campaigns since the 80s. Uh, and he's wearing the mask. And beside, in, in his, in his in, beside him, as the, the director of the national uh, immunization campaign in Brazil that's wearing a mask. And you can saw in the, in, in the background, there's a lot of politicians, uh, people from, from, from parliament that some using mask and another, they are not, not with mask. So this is, this is, uh, was in the, in the national media for everybody to see, and he almost never used mask. Never. So this is an important message 
for our people here right now that the mask doesn't matter. Uh, and the, this denial movement has some another part, as I told you, and I will pass very fast about this. Um, right now, as I told you, the um, indigenous people, they are, they are uh, very hesitant with the, the COVID-19 vaccine. There's some, um, I would say, tribals that doesn't uh, want to be vaccinated. They are refuse this because all this fake news that is in Brazil right now around the COVID-19 vaccination. This is a, a religion. Uh, I, I put some newspaper media on to, to see what is heaven, what is, is, what is doing in Brazil right now, what is happening. Uh, this is a, a religion, a religion, a spiritual leader, a religious leader that are saying that in the vaccine, we have the, the virus from HIV and uh, the vaccine, there's a plan that for everybody that received the vaccine to get uh, HIV disease. There's a lot of misinformation and this, this, this religion, this special religion, they are being persecuted persecute by, the, by the law because what they are saying for all his audience. So it's what we are facing right now here. And we have, um, beside the president that's saying a lot of nonsense and fake news uh, sentence, we are the religious leaders influence the indigenous people to not get the COVID-19 vaccination. This is the whole picture that we are uh, facing right now. And uh, about the vaccination, we have another problem here. This is a Twitter from the president that was um, the violate, the, uh, and you can see that the Twitter by the president was violate the law uh, because they are fake news saying that we have um, a treatment for COVID-19 and the most, uh, the most danger in Brazil right now is that the Brazilian government use, use our, our money, uh, the public money to promote a treatment that in the science was not proved yet. So the cooking in this treatment right now, and they are promote this. So this is the, the, the big picture. And beside that, the medical council, the federal medical council in Brazil, they are together with the president saying that this treatment can be, be doing for, for, for Brazilian people. So uh, they, right now they have to be explained because we are uh, in a lot of fight, a political fight here and people and other societies, other medical societies, scientific societies, they are against this movement, proving that we didn't have yet any early treatment for COVID-19. And, and this is very danger when people believe that if they took some medication, they are fine and they can go outside without mask, without doing social distance and so on. So this is the, the picture right now. And I'll show very quick the reaction of the scientific society. We, um, the, the, the most difficult part is how to confront this nonsense, this, this phrase, this fake news that there is no, uh, there is no any any rely with 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 reliance. So this is very very difficult to us to fight against the, against this. But many scientific society, as Abrasco, uh, RedeTB, uh, the um, Medical Society of Immunology, 
Medical Society of uh, Infectology and Pneumology, a lot of scientific society came together to try to fight against this fake news because we are alone, we are weaker, we cannot fight like with the center power, with all the media that they have and the, the importance that the, the, the feature of them has in our, in our society. So we create a website to fight with this fake news. And in this web, web, website, we have a lot of information that it's about what Julie said, came with this, this, this part, uh, try to, um, to make this, this, this fight against this, this fake news in the way that the fake news are, are, um, are building. We, we construct the same way. So it's easy to send like for the social media. Uh, in Brazil, uh, the, the WhatsApp is the biggest uh, problem for the, the fake news. Uh, the fake news goes very fast in this in this social media so we are doing a lot of of um material to go with this media too too so this is was uh, our plan and we work together with this and we call with this movement that that we is like air, um all for the vaccines so we 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 have a lot of uh actors uh, singers and a lot of scientists, sci scientists that came together with this movement in Brazil. And beside that, what we we can do when you are uh, the most important uh, influence, you are, you are the central power of the the president, the our government are spread the fake news. We joined together with other uh, research and we signed for an impeachment for the president saying all this crime that he's, he's, he did against the health, against our constitution. And right now we are, uh, the, the impeachment is in the parliament and you see what we will have in the, in the next and next months in Brazil. So, we call the, the victor of the science because in the first days in Brazil of the vaccination day in Brazil, we have this picture. This is, uh, we start with the health, um, the health professional and the, 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 the oldest people. And we can see the lines, which is terrible because we don't have like a, a very good organization, but the people people went go uh, get sorry went to the to the vaccination day and this is our first the first nurse that was vaccination in Brazil and right until now we are much more people that are going and and looking for the vaccination than people that are saying that we are not going to to get the vaccine so. I think in the end, uh, the balance is much, much better instead of everything that was happened in this year in, in 2020 and in beginning of this year in Brazil. So this is the campaign and a lot of, of uh, trying to, to fight with the fake news. And this is the alligator of the president and the Zé Gotinha that was right now uh, Ran hand of, of this. And this is a, a, a nurse that put his alligator fantasy to got the, the shot. So we, we, we can be, uh, we can laugh of, with all this, this horrible thing that we are having. And this finally, uh, I, I put the child chicken um, to, to show that in the same time that you have so many light with the science, we have this darkness of the, the, the misinformation and all, all these bad things. And this is my mother and my father got the shot just today. So 
thank the science and thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Professor Michelle. Uh, Ethel, I do love the fact that you've uh, completed your uh, a presentation with a quote from the first paragraph of that uh, Charles Dickens uh, book. I think it's a well-known uh, one. And uh, thank you for presenting really specific case. So we've had Julie Lease presenting, if you like, the broad issues and then uh, the more specific case here. And, and with that specific case, it raises a whole series of issues. We do have quite a number of questions that are coming in uh, through the Q&A and we'll get to those uh, after uh, Professor Anna Adani. And it's now my pleasure to, uh, uh, to ask Anna to bring up her uh, presentation and then to uh, please, uh, uh, Anna, we're looking for you, forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here this afternoon and I really would like to thank uh, Professor Michael Moore, Dr. Marta Romatti, and uh, the World Federation of Public Health Association for having organized this uh, webinar on such a crucial uh, topic. My, I know we are in the area of uh, digital events. I just thought of bring a little bit of context. This is the University of Pavia, where I'm talking to you from. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to mention that I'm talking from the University of Pavia, which was funded in 1361, is one of the oldest universities in the world. But the reason why I'm telling you that I'm talking from here is that because from Pavia, in Pavia, we had as public health professor many years ago, uh, Jonathan, John Peter Frank, which some of you might know is considered one of the first uh, public health physician who wrote um, a comprehensive nine volume treatise on all aspects of hygiene and public health. So I just wanted to give you a hint or the, or where, where I am. Um, my tasks, I know we are a bit short on time, is to bring the perspective of uh, healthcare workers. Um, we know a lot about uh, vaccines uptake uh, determinants. Uh, I'm glad that uh, one of our keynotes today was uh, my great friend Julie Lees, who have researched a lot on the determinants of vaccine uptake. So it is not important to remember, given that we are within public health experts, that if we talk about vaccination, we're not talking about vaccines. We know that vaccination means much more than having the availability of vaccines. And we do, not, we do know that uh, the determinants of uh, vaccine uptake relies on both uh, demand side determinants and supply side determinants. Um, and we have, especially in Italy, but also in Europe and across the world, researched a lot in recent times on determinants of vaccine uptake more specifically on the on the on the demand side and i'm glad that julie mentioned something her research about vaccine hesitancy so why are we talking about this in the covid 19 area because there are many things that are new um we all know that we are fighting a new pandemic infection in a new area we can call it the digital area but this is an important aspect to bring uh, to the discussion while discussing um, the perspective of specifically healthcare workers in the in the, in the, in the middle at the start, I would say, of the COVID nineteen immunization campaign. So first of all, two elements: uh, it is a new pathogen. We know that it is a new and very dangerous disease, counting uh, today. Uh, almost two and a half million deaths across the globe. And we're also talking about new vaccines. And those are all elements that have to be taken into account. And I do hope that we can discuss more uh, those issues in the panels that uh, will follow. So number one, we are facing something new with reference to the, the pathogen, the disease, and the vaccines that we are starting to have available. Um, number two, we are in a new area. We've been researching on previous pandemics, but in this 
we can call it digital era. I'm not, I mean, very strict on definitions, but this brings some elements, some new elements, both on the demand side, meaning that uh, the means of communication, the tools that we have to communicate and interact are um, somehow new for the first time in a pandemic area. And also the instruments that we do have to build on health education and health communication. But also on the supply side, we have uh, new tools to organize and manage preventive services delivery, which can be used to, 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 to make the campaigns more efficient, more rapid, and uh, to collect, to better collect uh, research and, and practice data. Um, why do we talk about healthcare workers? Well, for multiple, multiple reasons, and I'm just wanting to, to list them so that we can maybe expand on some of the points later. Um, we know that uh, healthcare workers, and it is a category that I belong to as many, as many of you, have been prioritized uh, at the start of the global uh, mass vaccination campaign for um, obvious reasons. Um, the, the WHO, together with other national health authorities, have uh, issued documents um, identifying which are the elements to allocate uh, the vaccines. And most of uh, the countries have started with the healthcare workers because, because we are uh, at higher risk of exposure, because vaccinating healthcare workers protects and sustain uh, health services. Uh, for ethical reasons and also because uh, healthcare workers do work in settings uh, where there are vulnerable populations. So there is the individual protective approach, but also uh, the protective approach in healthcare services. So this is very, very, very known. And if we look at the map of Europe and of the globe, we know we are now at the stage of uh, vaccinating healthcare workers, although at different pace and with different performances across uh, the countries. But um, having this target population uh, in mind, there are several uh, considerations that we might do on the demand side, but also on the supply side. Um, and I can already conclude, but I'm not finishing the presentations, that we are on an easy slope with reference to having to vaccinate a whole population. On the demand side, because there is a different risk perception, uh, and we do know that risk perception is one of the elements uh, influencing on the willingness to get vaccinated, balancing the protective effect of the vaccines and the side effects against the, the risks of getting infected and getting diseased. And we do expect and we do know that healthcare workers have higher knowledge, higher um, literacy, uh, and the preliminary data that we do have available confirm this. That. So um, on the demand side, we have some specific elements if we're looking at healthcare workers. Um, Preliminary data, I would say that we do have now available preliminary data on vaccines, attitudes and uh, um, awareness, um, hesitancy across the world. And those data are mostly preliminary, comes from uh, um, different, uh, different uh, research designs, but those data are confirming that there is a degree of uh, vaccine hesitancy within healthcare workers, physicians, nurses. We do have data from uh, France, Belgium, and Canada. We do have uh, data from Europe. We do have data from the United States. Um, and so those data are somehow changing over time because the spread of the epidemic and the attitudes of the population towards the vaccines while we were waiting for the vaccines. Now that the vaccines are becoming to be available, so those data on hesitancy and attitudes and are somehow changing over time. But also on the supply side, there are some specific issues. First of all, so by the supply side, I mean the organization and the offering of uh, preventive immunization services. Um, there are a few. I mean, we are talking about a small target population as compared 
to what we have planned in the in the months to come, which is the whole populations. Um, administration of vaccines happens in hospitals, uh, and so somehow the the delivery of uh, immunization services is relatively easy as compared to what we need to do from now on. And overall, the data that we have at the global European, but also I can talk about Italian level, um, are promising, are telling that uh, the acceptance, but also measuring and quantifying uh, adherence rate, we are going, we're doing very, very well. Um, the Italian case just to mention, we have started vaccinating healthcare workers at the end of 2020 on 31st of December. Um, our strategic plan issued by the Ministry of Health uh, declared that uh, health and social workers were to be prioritized. Of course, we have now vaccinated almost three uh, we have administered a 3 million doses for a total of a million two hundred, almost 300 healthcare workers. And those is, are the distributions by age, by type of vaccines and by target population. Um, as I was mentioning, the available evidence is, in my opinion, still accumulating relatively scant and of poor quality, as I was mentioning, is changing over time. We need to differentiate, I'm, I'm sorry, we do not have time now to differentiate between attitudes, measures versus adherence. And so to differentiate between demand and supply determinants of vaccine uptake. But overall, uh, we do have very high adherence to COVID-19 immunizations in healthcare workers, although with some degrees of differences between different categories of healthcare workers, ranging from highest adherence in physicians, nurses, and, and, and lower adherence in other types of uh, healthcare workers. Uh, overall, this is empirical data from the hospitals that we are in contact with in the north of Italy. Overall adherence of 75%, which increases to over 95% if we only include physicians and nurses. Um, we do not need to, I mean, we need to remember that physicians are important and healthcare workers in general also because of, they are uh, one of the highest sources of information and we can consider them role models for the whole population. So it is really important for, from a health system perspective, but also from the perspectives of the image and the examples that they do provide to the general population. Uh, and the public reactions and concerns to the hesitancies of healthcare workers can indeed have um, negative, negative consequences. So to uh, maybe provide some discussion points for what we will discuss in, in a couple of minutes, we can say that, uh, I mean, we, we repeat, this is, this is something that we all know we are in a new area, but this has to be taken into account when discussing how to influence the willingness to get vaccinated and how to provide good uh, vaccination services. Healthcare workers are key target populations for different reasons from the individual protection perspective, but also from the collective protection in healthcare settings and also for the sustainability of our health systems. Uh, there are specific features on the, both on the demand and supply side as compared to uh, other risk groups and to the general population, for sure. They are role models, so they have, we have to behave correctly uh, preliminary data that we are analyzing uh, shows that we're doing overall well on both the demand and supply side, but uh, should I say that it has been easy and the challenges with the general population uh, immunization campaigns are really yet to come because we will have different volumes and also different, very different target populations. So it's really the time uh, to join efforts to, to get there, to reach uh, herd immunity, starting from us, the public health community and the community of uh, healthcare workers. Thank you very much, in particular to my collaborators and to you all for the attention.
Thank you, Professor Anadani, and uh, how brilliant it was the, to follow these three talks and the way they worked uh, together to uh, really give us a much greater insight into the sorts of questions that, uh, we, are, that we are concerned about. Um, and I think I'll start with uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, we have uh, from Sheila Tlu. Uh, who was actually uh, one of our earlier uh, panellists uh, for one of our webinars. And, and I should point out uh, to uh, people who are following us that we have on the World Federation of Public Health Associations website, the, those previous webinars as, uh, as well that you can, uh, that you can view. Uh, will vaccine nationalism fuel hesitancy. And the question is really about uh, low and middle income countries and the, and the way they feel. So I'm going to begin the uh, first uh, question uh, with uh, Professor Ethel Maschel to see if uh, you would, uh, um, how you feel about uh, this one. Uh, please, uh, other panelists, buy in. Uh, would you like to begin the response to that, uh, Ethel? I don't know if it, I understood, Michael. Can you repeat the, the question? The question really is about vaccine nationalism. So if one country, particularly a wealthy country, is busily purchasing uh, vaccines, uh, and that means that a poorer country misses out, does that uh, missing out fuel a uh, reluctance to uh, believe that vaccines are appropriate. So we have this uh, in in Brazil right now. The the campaign is almost stopped because you don't have much 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 doses. Uh, we are seeing this in in Europe too no? because they. They already buy a lot of, of, of doses, but the, the industry are not, are not um, sending the, the doses. And we are seeing the, the poor countries uh, without any doses. So I think we need to, to, to build our, our, our vaccination plan as a global, because as we are seeing in Brazil right now, we have a new variant and we are seeing in, another, in other countries as um, European and South Africa, that we are the, the, um, the new variants that can put everything, all our effort um, in, in confront with this, this vaccine that we have right now, for our lucky, the um, RNA vaccine, they have, they can be building more fast, rebuilding more fast than others, but we, we need to think globally. I think this is the, what we are, we are missing right now. This is our, our the most uh, big mistake because we are thinking only in our own country in protect our people and this is not gonna, gonna end this disease. So I think this is the, 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 worst, the worst thing that we are doing right now and we are, need to work together. Professor Lesk, Chile. Yeah, isn't it funny how demand, a demand-based problem uh, can end up being such a massive issue? Uh, I don't know the answer to your question, but I think it's an excellent one. Whether na vaccine nationalism could um, increase hesitancy in lower resource settings, but we should ask. We should, I, I think it would be appropriate for someone who, or people who came from those settings to answer that question. But I guess if you think about possible scenarios, there's a risk that for example, uh, you know, what's emerging in some countries is this sort of sense of one vaccine's better than the other, or, you know, maybe in time it will be one vaccine is safer than the other. 
And if a country gets a vaccine that they perceive as being inferior, then that might create hesitancy. So, oh, this is the vaccine that the rich countries didn't want. Uh, and, you know, any licensed vaccine will be safe enough and effective enough, but that is a potential perception that could be concerning. But really, it's an empirical question, you know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I certainly hope not. Um, but, you know, whether it changes hesitancy, it is a, a, a major, major problem. And I don't know how, you know, as someone in a rich country where people want the vaccine now and they want the what they perceive to be the best one, and they're not happy that we have other ones that they perceive to be not as good, um, how you actually say to people, stop demanding vaccine, we need to give it to other countries when it's not a particularly politically salient argument to make is, a, is an interesting question. So these are huge issues. Thank you very much, Professor Liz. I would like to uh, go on with the question from uh, the audience and asking uh, Professor Odone about uh, how we as public health professionals can be better advocates. Indeed, sometimes uh, uh, we observe that some advocates can do more harm than good in polarizing debates or not recognizing the right battle to fight, especially in the social media. So what is your thought about that and how we could train a public health professional to be better skilled and have all the tools to be really effective advocates? Thank you very much for the question. Um, what I can say is, is that by us, and by us we refer to the public health community, first have to recognize that we do have a social responsibility towards population health protection. And this is something that we need to have in mind that is more important that uh, communication effectiveness. I mean, we need, we have a mandate to protect population health and we can get there um, with different competences and from different perspectives. So I acknowledge that we do possibly have a problems in uh, communication and that some people more than others are good in communicating and that maybe we should need to um, have multidisciplinary partnership with people then know how to communicate in order to, to get the right messages to the population. But, um, Maybe from a very personal point of view, what I can say is that what we are missing is the institutional level of communications. Uh, my message to especially young generation of public health professionals is that uh, to be credible, uh, we need to deliver the right messages, but also we need to be in an institutional position to do so. I think it is not important that Anna Odoni or Professor Lick says what she thinks. I think it is important to deliver a very institutional communication because there are, in this case, for example, of the COVID-19, too many voices, too many perspectives, too many people trying to say what they think. I do think we, we should rely and we should ask for very good, solid, credible, and also somehow authoritative uh, institutional communications at the technical, uh, level from our health authorities. This is something I think we should really work uh, for uh, at different levels. But if I can interrupt, um, Anna, you say that about the authoritative voices, but we've also seen in the United States and in Brazil, for example, where the top authoritative voices are doing exactly the opposite. In the United States, of course, you did have the head of the uh, Centre for Disease Control standing up and putting the scientific evidence. But um, what do you do when it's when it's at that level? And that's a question for all of you, but we'll start with Anna. Well, I mean, we are living a, a pandemic era. So for sure, everything is 
scaled up to the political level. Everything is political, geopolitical, and as Ethel was mentioning, it's 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 very tough. So also from a, from a global perspective. Um, I mean, but the responsibility of providing good, solid evidence and to communicate that stays at the technical level. I'm not referring to presidents, to governments. I'm referring to uh, technical agencies. And I think uh, more visibility, more role, and more, um, how do you say, power uh, should, we, should be put at that level. The technical scientific perspective the technical scientific bodies who should communicate. Michael, I think in the US, um, we there was, a, of course, a, a, a major challenge. And in Brazil, when you have the leadership, which uh, is undermining science. And what we've seen in the US is that people will you'll get emerging leaders. So this is a phenomenon in pandemics, whether you have a dysfunctional political leadership or not. You saw it with, um, for example, SARS in Toronto with Sheila Basra, who is an emerging leader, who was the face of calm during SARS. Uh, we've seen it with Anthony Fauci in the US, who's maintained a steady, uh, um, Trans as transparent as he probably could be, voice for public health. And there are, you know, there are plenty of people out there looking for that. So even though it makes it a lot harder when you've got this divisiveness that's wrought by leaders, you can still do things at a local level to um, uh, uh, be advocates for science. But I think Teresa's question there was about you know, how sometimes advocates can be unhelpful because they decide that they want to get, you know, into great big debates or fight anti-vaxxers. And we have to play the ball with this issue. We can't play the opponent because if we play the opponent, then we get lost in fighting with people and we've got enough fighting in this world and division and polarisation. And the, playing the issue is about reminding audiences of what vaccines are about. And there are very good advocates for vaccination out there. Um, and, and, you know, citizen advocates, for example, in Italy, a whole group of citizen advocates who have been very strong and connected in partnership with uh, public health professionals as well, also in Australia. And uh, those, those advocates, if, they're, if they become knowledgeable about what influences vaccination, what vaccines are important to promote. For example, Catherine Hughes in Australia and the Light for Riley Foundation, um, they got very focused on promoting maternal vaccination for pertussis. They, their son Riley died from pertussis. And they were great advocates and they still are um, because they learned what vaccine was important to promoting controlling pertussis from being connected with researchers and knowledge and, and, and they've looked, they've been very interested and keen to do that effectively. So there is a place for giving advocates the tools and the knowledge to communicate the science and know how to communicate the science as well. Um, can I say, Michael? Sure. <laughs> uh, because what, what I, I completely agree with Julie and, and Anna, but the problem is how to act in a completely um, hostile environment. So it's, it's in, in a normal environment is exactly what Julia said. We are, we, we are stand up for the science and we are say all about this, but it's, in a completely um, hostile environment, when what we are doing, it's, uh, um, it's one way to be like prosecution. Uh, we are, it, it's, it's very, 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 very hostile. If you stand up to say the truth, we are the opponent. 
we are uh, we are in the exactly time we are against the the the, the authorities so right now i'm against the authority and you have to be very brave to stand up in a very uh, unsafe environment, in a, in a very strange and hostile environment. Right now in Brazil, people are dying without oxygen and the president are promote the arm. They are, they are, they are promote that people can buy gun, guns so this is what we are facing. It's a completely, it's a nonsense. There is there is not a normal environment, and this is the problem we have. For the we have two minister of health that was fired because they didn't. They they was the opposite of the president. They are they are stand up for for they they stand for the science and they are fired. And right now we have a military a military person that are in the in the health minister they didn't know nothing about this they didn't have experience in health and they and this is the problem we are not in a normal environment and when when we are not in a normal environment you have to re rebuild yourself because all that you learn it doesn't it doesn't work anymore. So it's, it's it's stressful. We are always in this very stressful environment. When you woke up in the day, we have to fight with another lie. It's, there's another thing. It's it's all day long, all, all day, all day. So it's very, very, very stressful days for being a scientist in Brazil right now. Thank but, you very much, Professor Marcial. Um, the problem remains very, very important, and each nation has a very different context and approach, and we really appreciate the efforts of all the scientists that are working in this, uh, towards real science and to strengthen vaccination confidence. Um, I would like to move on another question we got from the audience dealing with indigenous uh, people because uh, both uh, Brazil and Australia have a very important indigenous uh, population and uh, as Professor Marcial said before, uh, we really needed to understand and tackle their cultural sensitivity and their beliefs uh, when we uh, um, want to make them confident in vaccination. So um, do you have any good example of how you have communication effectively vaccination to tribals, to indigenous people? And how have you integrated the traditional, um, let's say approach to their social cultural acceptabilities in your more general national activities uh, uh, around vaccination? I would like to start with the Professor Maciel and then move to uh, Professor Lisk. So I think what we, we need to do is work with them because uh, we cannot say our message for, for them because we, it's another culture, we have to respect that. And uh, what we are doing right now, because uh, we have in the past, investment for, for the indigenous to be like a physician, a nurse, to study, to be that. And they are right now working in their, in their, with their people and try to, to explain them the importance, the, the, the vaccine, the importance to, to their culture. Because uh, I, I don't know in, in Australia, but probably is the same as in Brazil, they are, um, they come, they have a lot of uh, cultural parties that they, they, they bring them together. They are, so the social distance is very difficult to them because they, they, they meet uh, together in, in a lot of tradition, in dancing, in singers, in, in all, all, they have a lot of parties. So this has been, uh, use of uh, use for the the I don't know how do you say cacique cacique is the the chief of the the indigenous I don't know this name in English 
So they are a, a very important key to, to say the message for, for the indigenous culture, to say that it's important to be vaccinated because they can be again together, they can uh, do again the things that they are doing before the, the, the pandemic. So this is what uh, they are doing right now, working with the, the chiefs and the people that work in the health, but they are indigenous to try to, to, to talk with the other indigenous in order to, to make the evidence less than they are right now. Uh, so Australia has a, a, a really nice example of success um, from our Indigenous people. So we, we would call our Indigenous people uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders or First Nations. Uh, and in back in 2009, the H1N1 pandemic had caused a very high burden of disease in our Indigenous, in our uh, First Nations people. And uh, there was a real determination to learn from that and to make sure that pandemic planning included considerations about First Nations communities and made sure that the, pan pan the planning had a level of cultural respect and thoughtfulness about what all, of the, all parts of the plan might mean for Aboriginal communities. And some work was done uh, with uh, communities in Queensland and New South Wales, where um, during that pandemic, um, the communities, were, there was qualitative research done. They talked with the communities, they looked at what they wanted, how they wanted to be communicated with during a pandemic. And they heard things like, we want you to ask us and listen to us and then share your information so that it meets our needs. We want culturally respectful um, strategies and services in managing the pandemic. And we, we think you should use go to people and you should not be token with, the, with your communications. Don't just put an Aboriginal flag on, on your pamphlet that you haven't developed with us and thinking about us. And those lessons were brought into the, man, the management of this pandemic and our Aboriginal community controlled sector. So this is health organisations that are controlled by Aboriginal communities and for Aboriginal communities um, had a very high representation role with government, level with government, so that there was negotiation, there was leadership. And we ended up having lower rates of COVID and uh, among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here, and higher rates of testing among our First Nations people. So uh, real success story. And I think it's a story that needs to be shared with the world. And it's about negotiation and a self-determination of those communities, but also access to the knowledge and the um, the people in power at a very high level, right from the very beginning of the pandemic. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, and uh, as you would be aware, this is a, an area of great interest uh, for me. And one of the things uh, I think is interesting amongst Indigenous people in Australia is that although their health outcomes are much poorer in many ways than other Australians, they are one of the highest vaccinating groups uh, in Australia, so uh, particularly for their children. Uh, and so it's a, one of the really positive stories amongst our um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I'd like to move to the next question, and I'll start with uh, uh, Anna, if I can. Uh, and it's about uh, the um, a question from uh, Pauline, but it's come through in a number of uh, other uh, uh, questions really is about concerns around side effects of uh, being immunised and uh, some of the adverse incidents uh, and how should we address this because doesn't that uh, add to hesitancy or break down uh, confidence so how do we address that? Thank you very much Pauline for, for the question. Um, I mean the discussion about risk 
perception. So how much danger is getting vaccinated against being protected against the, the infection and the disease is a debate uh, and it's something we have been looking at also prior to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, our feelings, our perception, our the preliminary data that we are analyzing are telling us now that the risk perception balance, as I was mentioning during my, my introductory talk, have moved. And the, the concerns about the vaccines from what we know are less around the side effects of a vaccine and more around these new uh, types of, of vaccines. Uh, to answer uh, Pauline's question, I would say that first of all, data on side effects, all, all, all sorts of side effects, local and systemic side effects are to be collected uh, in real life. And those are being collected because this is what we are obliged to do for, for normative and, and pharmacal surveillance reasons. And the preliminary data that we do have available uh, tell us that those vaccines are safe. The safety of vaccines um, were collected in experimental studies and those brought to the approval and put into uh, market of the vaccines, but also the so-called real-time data that we are collecting are telling us that vaccines are safe and the degree of side effects are very, very, very low. I think the message is not that those vaccines are not coming with side effects. Side effects are there of different degrees. It is important to collect data and to tell that those are possible and that the health services are organized in order to take into account them and to intervene should those side effects uh, be, be present. And the, to work on the risk balance and the risk perception um, debate. Um, I should say that the the, the concerns about side effects from what we are observing in, uh, in, in, in hospitals are not as higher as we would expect, as it has been mentioned for other vaccines uh, in the past, in, in our experience, to be honest. Thanks, Anna. Either of the other two would like to add to uh, the very comprehensive answer that uh, Anna has given. Yeah, just quickly. Uh, it's, it's not an easy time to talk about vaccine safety because the science on these vaccines is still evolving, although we do have quite a lot from those trials and now the rollout in, um, I think it's almost 200 million people, maybe more now. But, um, you know, the general rules around risk communication are that you're honest, frank and open. You don't over reassure people and you acknowledge where there is uncertainty but you also tell people what you do know and what you're doing to find out more. Um, when you talk about risk, you don't dismiss it, but you pivot to um, what we do know about the vaccine risks are that they, uh, they can cause uh, you to feel a bit unwell in the day after the vaccine. And that will happen in, for a headache, it will happen in six in 10 people. So you give numbers, um, you give, qualitative estimates of risk. You might say anaphylaxis is very, very rare. It happens in about estimated one in 100,000, although I think we're getting new numbers on that all the time. And, and, and then, you, but you don't stick with vaccine safety, you pivot to prevention. And you remind people of what the big picture is here, which is similar to what Anna was saying, that this is about preventing COVID and um, and, and so you, 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 you sort of talk about the gain of vaccines as well when you're talking about safety. Thank you very much. Professor Marcel, you want to comment or two? Only a, a little detail that here, the, the hesitancy is more about things that the vaccine doesn't, um, doesn't do then the adverse events, for example. So it's like the, the one ship that Bill Gates put in the vaccine and he can control everybody and uh, thinks that uh, the vaccine 
uh, from Pfizer, you be change your DNA. So it's it's more things that it's it's not real than than the adverse events from the the vaccine itself. So only this. Thank you very much. I would like to um, highlight one question from our president-elect uh, uh, from Brazil, Luis Eugenio de Souza, that is asking, uh, how can we deal with the health professional doctors, nurses um, that are against the uh, COVID-19 vaccination? How we as health professionals, as scientists, or how the government should deal with the problem? And I would like to, to listen to the opinion of the three of you from very different countries and very different contexts uh, to give a suggestion, an example of uh, the best practice in, this, uh, in the management of this problem. May I? Um, I mean, um, it, is, it is a tricky issue. First of all, I should say that uh, the percentage of healthcare professionals refusing to get the vaccines is, at least in Italy, I'm not sure about other countries, very, very low. This is just to put things into context. We are not experiencing this as a major problem, but if you have one single healthcare professional uh, refusing to get vaccinated, you do have a problem. So I'm saying that uh, looking at the data, this is a tiny problem, but it is, of course, a problem because how would you, as a citizen, uh, access healthcare facilities where you know you are in danger because healthcare professionals are not vaccinated? So it is important to talk about it, even if, uh, I mean, we are not experiencing this as a major problem. Um, and the, in here, we, 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 we can talk about uh, uh, our perspective, the physician's perspective, but it really scales up into the normative level. So in Italy, you know that we do have a law on compulsory vaccination for childhood vaccinations, which was approved in 2017. We do not have, although many of us are advocating for that, a law for compulsory vaccinations, for example, for influenza for healthcare workers. And there is debate around us. What uh, the tools, the normative tools that we do have here in Italy is that you can prevent healthcare workers from working if they are not vaccinated. And we do have some examples at the local level of this happening for coronavirus. And I do think that from an ethical point of view, but also from a communication point of view and from an institutional point of view, this is very um, effective and this is something that has to be pursued. Um, there are other people thinking that also the tool of compulsory vaccination for healthcare workers is something that might work. Um, I mean, I'm also, eager to listen what my colleagues Julie and Ethel think about it, but what I can bring is the Italian, the Italian, the Italian case, which is an evolving scenario uh, over time. We're just now finishing to have healthcare workers vaccinated in the next few weeks. Thank you very much, Anna. Professor Lisk, what is your opinion? This is a really difficult issue. When you have, uh, particularly in the public arena, a prominent doctor in particular going against vaccination, um, and I'm not talking so much here about general sort of trenchant hesitancy among healthcare workers, but I'm talking about one advocate, um, they can have a profound effect on vaccine programs. And if you look at all the major vaccine safety scares, that have ended with lowered vaccination rates and disease outbreaks. The common element is a prominent doctor, MMR autism with Wakefield, Dutty Ahmed with Northern Nigeria and polio boycott um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, Gordon Stewart in the UK. Uh, in, in Japan, I know doctors have joined with parent groups to undermine the HPV vaccine. And so, it's important to tackle it quickly. And there are, there, there are many different ways of doing that. One is to look at who they might be influencing um, and gathering data on that is important. Um, the second is to be um, 
working with the people that they might immediately influence who themselves could be, who could then could lose confidence in vaccination. And so one of the things about the, the prominent doctors or, or other scientists who goes against vaccination is that their peers might listen to them and they, they can be very convincing and, and compelling. Um, you also have to, so you, you address the concerns of the people that they're influencing, like other physicians, for example, and do it quickly before they start to form their own views. And um, the communication when these things happen has to be very proactive because if governments don't respond and in a, in a strong way, uh, they can end up with a real issue where a lot of people start to, to, you know, it's contagious, these concerns about vaccination. So it's something that needs to be addressed quickly. And we have more information on addressing these, just these sorts of scenarios actually, in that WHO um, uh, vaccine safety communication module from the GACS working group that I shared in my presentation that I'm happy to share with the, the World Federation for people to get access to. Um, but that has quite a lot in it about addressing these sorts of scenarios that can come up with new vaccine programs and old programs as well. Thank you very much. Professor Marcel, you wanted to add your thoughts. In Brazil, we are, we are not seeing a lot of um, hesitancy in, in health professional, but we have, and uh, they are very dangerous exactly for what Anna, Anna said, because they, they have this authority to, to say that vaccine are not good, the vaccine was, was developed very fast and, and it's unsafe, and this is what is is they are saying, uh, but our Supreme Court in Brazil, because in our constitution, uh, the vaccination is a, a obligate, and there's some there's a group of, of of people that came from the Supreme Court asking for the right of freedom to not have been vaccinated, and the, the Supreme Court decide that the constitutional is is have to follow and is a obligate obligation. So uh, if you are a health professional and work in a hospital, in a uh, health unit, you have to, you need to, to have your, your vaccination card in, in, you have to have all the vaccine uh, and uh, inclusive the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is right now in Brazil. Thanks very much. Uh, there are many other questions uh, there that are all important questions, but unfortunately, we have uh, almost run out of time. Uh, before I ask each of you just to give a final, very, very brief uh, comment to wind up, um, I would like to thank uh, um, the University of Geneva, uh, Pfizer, and the World Federation of Public Health Associations for their support for this webinar. So uh, I'll ask each of you to make a final comment and then Dr. Lamazzi to conclude. Uh, I'll start. Um, listen to your publics. There's not just one public. And use, use evidence, um, gather data, so you know what you're dealing with, you know the prevalence and um, talk to people and, and, and find out what their issues are and pre-test your messages so you know that they're compelling and keep engaging, braving the discontent. Uh, it's not easy, particularly in countries like Brazil, uh, but um, you're doing great work there, um, Professor Ethel and uh, Congratulations to you and your colleagues. Ethel. Oh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I do like to ask a abraço to 
that is doing a very wonderful work in Brazil, fighting against all this, this misinformation and all their scientific society. And I would like to say for people that are listening us to believe in science, to believe in, in scientific evidence. And uh, although we have to, to, to say in, in what side of the fight we, we are, we always need to, to get this, this, this science uh, with us. So thank you very much for the World Federation to, to have me here. Thank you. Thank you, a Anna and Julie and Marta and Michael. Thank you. Of course, also for me, it has been a great pleasure to share the discussion with wonderful female colleagues. Um, if I may, a conclusive note from my side could be, uh, and is targeting also our wonderful audience, is do feel at all levels the responsibility that we do have in public health to protect population health, and do trust people. Uh, health education at all levels, and by all levels I mean in schools, Let's start from primary school, from childcare, to educate people, to communicate people, scientific data, because people can understand very well. And the level of information, correct information that they do have will influence their uh, behaviors towards health of themselves, and of their peers, of their colleagues, and of the whole community to feel the responsibility that you have and do trust people. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you to all our two incredible speakers, um, Professor Maciel, Professor Lisk, and Professor Odone. It has been a very, very uh, useful webinar, and thanks a lot to Professor Moore that has co-chaired this event together. I cannot do much more than joining the message of these three speakers. Believe in science, listen to people, be kind, and don't forget to be a leader, to be a public health leader in every context or situation you are, whatever is your level of working, uh, whatever is your situation in the country based on political, social, religious um, concern, but don't forget you are a leader and you need to be courageous as you have been up to now. That said, you will be able to listen again to this webinar as well as to the other webinars led by the World Federation of Public Health Association uh, International Immunization Policy Task Force on our uh, website and YouTube channel. And uh, feel free to contact us to be informed about the next event, as well as uh, to get more insight about all the policies we are developing and implementing. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a great uh, day or night or afternoon, depending where you are based. Bye-bye. <laughs>